Good morning, willing workers, and welcome to our lesson for Sunday, May 8th, 2022. And we'll go ahead and get right into our lesson for today. The title is Enduring, and we take it from the book of 2 Thessalonians. Uh, as I mentioned last week, uh, didn't know if we would go get into this book, but it looks like we will cover uh, the three chapters of Second Thessalonians over the month of May. Our uh, uh, lesson takes its message from Second Thessalonians chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 3 to 12 today. Uh, and as we go through our lesson, let's remember that the theme is Christ enables believers to persevere in or with faithfulness. Now, let's read what Paul has written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to these uh, Christians in Thessalonica. Paul writes, We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. Uh, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this second letter of Paul's to the Thessalonians uh, came only about a year later than his first letter. So we can date this letter sometime around 51 to 52 AD. Like Paul's initial letter, uh, this letter was sent with blessing, his blessing on the Thessalonians and the blessing of his traveling companions. Uh, Silvanus or uh, Silas as we know him from scripture and Timothy were the uh, messengers to carry this letter back to the Thessalonians. And similar to the uh, first letter, this letter opens with a brief blessing and prayer for grace and peace uh, to the Thessalonian Christians. Uh, demonstrating his ongoing concern for the Thessalonians, Paul assured them of his prayers for them and of his gratitude for their love and their spiritual growth that they have continued to experience. Paul recognized that their endurance during persecution and 
And he recognized that and he encouraged them to keep trusting in their Lord and Savior, Jesus. Such faithfulness would allow the Thessalonians to expand their ministry and bring joy uh, to uh, the other Christians and, of course, bring glory to Christ. In some ways, this book, 2 Thessalonians, summarizes Paul's message in the first letter, 1 Thessalonians. It is shorter uh, than the first letter, but and Paul reviews much of the same teaching that he taught in the first letter here in the second. But he also provided practical instruction for living out the faith that is worthy of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Let's get into our verses for today. In verse 3, Paul uses this word interpreted ought, O-U-G-H-T, and is taken from a root word that implies a debt to be paid by someone. This root word is the Greek root word, and uh, it indicates a moral obligation that someone has. It's not necessarily a monetary debt. It is a moral obligation obligation that one has. Now, that moral obligation can include financial, but it also includes many other things. Uh, this was not mentioned to uh, because Paul was motivated by guilt or dread for these Thessalonians. He loved them. He loved the report that he had gotten. Uh, but it was a natural response of thanksgiving that Paul, as a Christian, uh, has uh, to God's work among the Thessalonians. Paul was thankful to God for guiding the Thessalonians in their progress and in their faithfulness. Paul had urged his brothers in Christ in the first letter to increase their faith. And now he's acknowledging that their faith has abounded and that uh, they are continuing to grow. Uh, the Thessalonians' love for one another was increasing. That's the words that Paul used. Uh, it was, that could be uh, uh, compared to something like a river overflowing its banks during flood season. We know that the Egyptians utilized the annual flooding of the Nile River to uh, make their fields fertile so they could grow their crops uh, each year. And this is uh, similar uh, language and similar comparison, like their love was overflowing the banks of the church there in Thessalonia. And right now it was a flood season for the Thessalonian church as they expanded their love not only for one another, but for those in other churches and those in the community. God is love. We know that. John wrote that in one of his letters that he wrote. God is love, and love should define God's people. John 13, 34 and 35 tell us that. 1 John chapter 4, 7 and 8 tell us that also. But love flows from a mature faith. And that's why Paul connected the two ideas. While faith represents the vertical dimension of the Christian life, that is our faith in Christ is the vertical dimension, our work, if you will, the horizontal dimension is the uh, love that we show to one another and to our neighbor, uh, and to our enemy, as Jesus commanded us, and that is the horizontal dimension of our faith. Paul was thankful that the Thessalonians had embraced both of these dimensions, vertical and horizontal, in their Christianity. Now, uh, chapter, verse 4, Paul's letter, uh, letters, uh, this word, therefore, uh, signifies a transition from one thought to the 
next thought. And in this case, from a statement of gratitude that Paul has made to the result of that gratitude. Because the Thessalonians were following Christ and they were doing a good job of it. Paul could boast about them. This Greek word that Paul used appears only here in the New Testament. And it carries the idea of holding one's head up high. Not in arrogance, not in, not in snobbery, but holding your head up high because you belong to Christ and Christ is working in you. Paul's boasting recognized God as the one who was orchestrating the Thessalonian success. And Paul used it to challenge the other congregations that he wrote to, to follow their example. Paul now connected faith with steadfastness. This is also in verse 4. The same character quality that allowed Paul's readers to love one another also empowers those same readers to remain faithful to Christ through per persecutions and through afflictions. The Greek tense used here, I mentioned this before, the tense of the Greek uh, makes a lot of difference in how you understand any given statement that is made. And the, the tense used here indicates that the situation was an ongoing situation. In other words, the persecutions and the afflictions were an ongoing uh, situation that the Thessalonians had to persevere in. And it was uh, reasonable for Paul and other Christians to uh, think that the Thessalonians were persevering because of their faith. Uh, and uh, that perseverance and persecution actually was because of their faith. Paul emphasized that the Thessalonians were enduring their suffering well. This was something that Paul understood from personal experience. We know the trials and tribulations of Paul from his letters. And uh, he had suffered persecution during his time, even in Thessalonica. You recall that Paul only spent three Sabbath days there. And from those three Sabbath days, we have this church established. And it is growing, uh, growing by leaps and bounds uh, in Christ and for Christ right there. Verses 5 and 6. Paul noted that the Thessalonians' endurance during their persecution was evidence of God's work and of their worth as Christian witnesses in Thessalonica. Their perseverance demonstrated the validity of the gospel and it highlighted the supernatural strength that kept the Thessalonians moving forward as it revealed the depth of their faith in God's justice. Not only was the gospel worthy, Paul emphasized that the Thessalonians themselves were worthy because of their faith and of their endurance. While the Thessalonians suffered or their suffering did not earn salvation for them, it did prove that they were living as residents of the kingdom of God here on earth. And that's the way we should think about ourselves, dear Christians. We are sojourners in this world. Our heavenly home is just that. It is located in heaven. When we were saved, we became citizens of heaven and aliens in residence in earth. The afflictions of the Thessalonians were working to make them more like Christ. God would honor their faithfulness when Jesus returned. The Thessalonians were suffering for the sake of the gospel and their full reward was 
was on its way with Christ's return. Paul encouraged the Thessalonians to continue trusting God that God will make things right when Jesus returns. It was just for God to repay with affliction those who were afflicting them. And that's right directly from the letter that Paul wrote. God's vengeance is rooted in God's righteous character. And in the end, the suffering of those who persecute God's people will be worse than anything that God's children have to endure. Verses 7 and 8. Paul's future focus allowed Paul to accept any and all difficulties of the moment because Paul knew something greater was on the way. Do we think like that? We have something greater on the way. Do we suffer our afflictions? Do we suffer whatever persecutions we get uh, with that view in mind? God was aware that the Thess of the Thessalonians' struggles, just as he's aware today of our own struggles. God knew they were suffering, just as God knows we suffer today. As God was just in judging those who afflict his people, he was also and is also able to grant relief to his children. The Greek wording here includes the idea of rest or release from troubles. I don't think that we as Christians today can fully understand the relief that we will experience when we enter heaven. The rest that we will have despite being given work to do in heaven. It will be restful. And the relief will be beyond anything I think we can imagine today. Now, as God was just in judging those who afflicted his children, he was also just to grant relief to his children. The Greek wording here includes the idea of rest and release from troubles. This rest came in two ways. First, the Thessalonians could have peace in knowing that God was using their pain for his purposes. I refer you to Romans 8, 28. For we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. That's us Christians. Everything that happens to us, good, bad, and indifferent, will work out in the end to be good. We just don't see it now. We don't think it's happening now. But God is working on it. And it will be brought to our good, even if it's in heaven that our good is attained. Second thing, God would be faithful in righting the wrongs those people have done to us just as he has been faithful in every other aspect of the Thessalonian spiritual lives and our spiritual lives, he will be faithful uh, in righting the wrongs that have been done to us. The phrase, as well as to us, reminded the Thessalonians that they were not alone. <clears throat> And when we read these, this phrase in Paul's letter especially, we are to uh, understand that we as Christians today are included in that as well as to us. And uh, we're to be reminded that Paul went through this. We're not alone. Paul's been through it. Christ went through it. And our uh, ancestors in the Christian faith have been through it as well. 
Paul reminded his friends that God's timing is what matters, even when his relief might not show up until the Lord Jesus Christ returns. I think that's the hardest thing that Christians, and especially we Christians who have been brought up in the land of freedom here in the United States, uh, we want everything now. And it's just not God's timing now. We have to come to live with the fact that God's timing is always perfect. And it's not always our timing. You know, God doesn't do things according to what his children want. He does things according to the plan that he has already laid out. And we need to remember that. Paul used the Greek word apocalypse, uh, which refers to an unveiling. We have apocalyptic work that's an unveiling uh, of, uh, in the case of the book of Revelation, uh, the unveiling of Jesus Christ and the end times. We have same apocalyptic language in the book of Daniel, the book of Ezekiel, the book of Isaiah, and a number of other Old Testament books as well. <clears throat> uh, this apocalyptic work refers to an unveiling of something that was once hidden. Sometimes God's works are seen in the moment, but the purpose behind our suffering will remain a mystery until Christ returns with his mighty angels. Now, we can, we can read about that in Mark 8, verse 38. Either way, God will make things right. God's vengeance on his people's enemies will be an experience like no other thing that Paul described. Paul uses the word here, God's judgment is as a flaming fire. I want to remind you that fire in the Bible, while it is destructive, it's also a purifying agent. God's uh, appearing in the burning bush uh, was a flame and that flame did not consume the bush but that flame represented the purity of God's holiness uh, flames destroy large areas quickly we know how fast a fire can uh, increase in its size uh, and this of course can be the vengeance of God is as a flaming fire that can't be quenched, can't be put out. It's also, as I've already said, a symbol of God's presence and holiness. Paul used two terms to describe the recipients of God's judgment. The first term, he said, they do not know God. Now that means in the intimate sense of knowing someone. And it's more important that God knows you rather than you know God. Everybody, well, I can't really say everybody, but most people know there's a God. They know something about him. They might even know of this man named Jesus. They might even uh, think of him as God's only begotten son. But here's the second problem that they face. They do not obey the gospel of Christ. Folks, that's what makes us Christians. We obey the commands of our Lord and our Savior. He saved our souls in order that he could command us what to do. And we have a hard time with that in the land of the free here in the United States. Verses 9 and 10. C.S. Lewis, as we know, was a philosopher, but he became a Christian, uh, uh, I think, sometime around his 40s. And uh, once he was a Christian, he noted that there are two kinds of people that make up the human race. And one of them is those who say to God, thy will be done. 
That would be the Christian way, the Christians. But he said there's a second kind, and that's those whom God says in the end, thy will be done. And so those who rebel against God, who do not accept Christ as their Lord and Savior, and the only way into heaven, their will will be done in hell. So Paul used a legal term here to explain how God's enemies will suffer the punishment for their sin. That penalty included eternal destruction. I don't think that we in this life can fully understand the eternal destruction that awaits those who have rejected God. Hell was created for God, for Satan and his angels. And it is the abode where all who disobey God, all who reject his son, Jesus, are to go as well. The eternal destruction is I don't, I don't know how to really describe it. I've never been really to the point of death. Uh, I might think I was when I was getting the severe cancer treatments that I got this last time three years ago. But if, if there's any way to imagine that you are just moments from dying, uh, that and, and extending that feeling, that sense for all of eternity is what eternal destruction is. You, your soul never dies. The body that God gives the unregenerate person is able to withstand all the flames of hell, all the pains of whatever illness, whatever disease uh, will be put upon it. And it will be as if you were dying and you want to die, but you never do. The destruction will take the form of an everlasting suffering without the presence of God. His absence represents hell's most excruciating torture. Now, I'm going to go against our lesson here because it is my belief that God is omnipresent. And if hell is a real place, and I believe it is, God is present there. And I think that God is the one who keeps hell continuing. And those who are in hell know God is continuing their torture, their eternal destruction. The unregenerate in this life, they get to breathe the air God made, just as we do. They get to see the beauty of the creation that God has made for man's benefit and for his glory. And Jesus himself in Matthew 5, 43 to 45, he noted that God allows the sun to rise and the rain to fall on the just as well as the unjust. Those are benefits. Those are God's benevolence toward his creation and toward all people. But hell has none of that. Hell has no relief. Hell is eternal destruction to those who do not believe. Darkness and despair will overwhelm those people consigned to hell. Uh, 
and they will have no hope of any relief. God's mercy today is what holds his wrath at bay. There will be a day when his wrath will come upon his creation. His wrath will come upon the unregenerate. Pray to God that you will not be counted among the unregenerate that day. For you will never feel anything like the good things you feel today. Even when you are sick, you still have good things to feel. And in that day, no one will. God's mercy does have a time limit. When Jesus returns, God will come in judgment. The great devastation experienced by sinners will stand in stark contrast to the incredible joy uh, that we experience in God's presence. Paul explained that when Christ returns, he will be glorified in his saints and marveled at by his followers. Remember, we, re we studied this in the lessons in 1 Thessalonians. We will be glorified and meet Christ in the air. And we will marvel at our Lord and Savior. And uh, our ideas of His beauty and glory, they have no comparison in this reality. Uh, we have yet to experience the glorification of Christ, of God, and of ourselves. Our human ideas just can't come up with descriptions. So we will be awestruck when we see our Savior face to face. The Thessalonians accepted Paul's testimony. They could trust God to avenge their suffering. And their future was secure in their Savior and Lord Jesus. Verse 11, the phrase to this end, to this end, refers back to the perseverance and example set by Paul's readers. It connects with the promise of God's justice and relief in the future. Paul responded by praying for his friends. He asked God to make the Thessalonians worthy of his calling, and he commended them as worthy. Paul reminded them of their responsibility to provide evidence of their relationship with Christ. Again, this is application for us today that we are reminded to provide evidence of our relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Genuine believers consistently nurture their spiritual growth and they strive to become more like Jesus every day. We are all trophies of God's grace, but we can live in a way that draws His approval rather than His displeasure even as Christians, at our very best, we can't always please God. We do things sometimes makes you wonder if we're Christians and certainly displeases our, our Lord and Savior. Paul's prayer also included a petition to God to help the Thessalonians experience God's approval. Let's extend that out to us today. Paul's prayer here is for God to help us to experience God's approval each and every day. Dear Christian, I hope you pray regularly. I hope part of that prayer includes this petition to our God to give us, to help us to do those things that are acceptable to God. Verse 12, Paul continues his prayer here. Uh, it, he explains the results of living as a worthy resident of the heavenly kingdom. Ultimately, 
The mission of believers is to point others to Christ. This was the emphasis in Paul's prayer for the Thessalonians. While he prayed they would continue in good works, those good works should honor the name of our Lord Jesus. For Paul, the name of Jesus was tied to his, Paul's position, oh, excuse me, to Jesus' position as Lord and Messiah. So Paul called on the Thessalonians to exalt Jesus by revealing him as Savior. That is an application for us today as well. Believers are progressively being made into Christ's glorious image each and every day. But that process will not be fully accomplished in this life. That's why we call it sanctification and we become more like Christ. But only at our death and our entry into heaven is our sanctification complete. Our ultimate glorification will be the final result of the spiritual transformation that began by God's grace in our very soul. And just as salvation and sanctification depend on God's grace, our final state in eternity will depend completely upon Him and His only begotten Son. We cannot earn that position. We cannot work as Christians for that position. Through God's unmerited favor, we will be like Jesus. Go and read it in 1 John 3, verses 1 to 3. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time we've had in your word today. I pray, Father, that Paul's prayer and his admonitions in this part of the letter will be things that we can understand for our own benefit today and be able to put them into practice in our spiritual lives as we live for Christ each and every day. In whose name I pray. Amen.